everybody i'm gary mclean and you are watching talent talk thanks for tuning in i do appreciate it uh, i do want to throw out the reminder that uh if you can please go to the talent talk youtube channel and subscribe to the channel today as always your uh, support is highly appreciated and also a reminder that this is a live and interactive show so if you have any questions comments just want to say hi throw it into the comments section and we will do what we can to kind of address it as the show goes on. Now, today's guest, he's a country singer, actor, director, born here in Calgary, but now resides in Vancouver. We won't hold that against him. Um, his music has led him to touring with Shania Twain and multiple Canadian uh, Country Music Award nominations. And on the film side, uh, he's directed multiple music videos, which have also garnered him multiple CCMA Awards uh, nominations. And it's also led to his current role as Pierre on the new Paramount TV series Guilty Party, starring Kate Beckinsale, with some of the filming taking place right here in Calgary as well. So please join me in welcoming Wesley McGinnis. Hey. Hey, how's it going, Wes? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Well, thanks for coming. I, I do appreciate it for sure. And My uh you're in Vancouver right now, I take it? Yeah, I am. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you know, are you a Canucks fan? I, okay. So, I yeah. All right. We'll go right. We'll go right for the jugular off the bat. So, just, yeah. So I, I am both a diehard Flames and Canucks fan, which I realize makes me hated by all of my friends in Calgary <laughs> and all my friends in Vancouver. There is not a single person who's okay with it uh, on either side. I've just, I've lived almost exactly half my life in Calgary and half of it in Vancouver. And I, for the first like six or seven years living here, I was like hardcore anti Canucks. And then at some point the entire roster had changed. So it was like, it was no longer the team that I'd like grown up hating anymore. Um, so that's, that's where Clean I, got. State. I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I love what <laughs> I love watching hockey and I played hockey all growing up. And so I've got no place where I love both, but I'm, I'm the only one. So just, just me. I don't know. We'll try not to hold it against you. I, yeah, I will. Now, anyway. I will say though, officially, I, I always would still cheer for the Flames over the Canucks. That's that's like I, I can't I can't get rid of my my hometown. Uh, uh, if if they play each other, I'm, that's what I'm cheering. You know, you know, what? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm actually uh, also a Bruins fan. Okay. Um, and it was funny because up until one game where the Flames and Bruins were playing against each other, I wasn't actually sure who I was going to cheer for until yeah. the first goal was scored. And then it's like, oh, okay, that's who I'm cheering for, which was Calgary. So See, it, it always messes with me. I don't actually enjoy watching Flames Canucks games. I used to love watching those. Um, but I don't now because I always find myself, you know, and they, they, there was a couple of years ago, they, they were in the first round of the playoffs together. And, and I thought like, oh, this is great. Like one of my favorite teams will definitely go on to the next round. And I just found myself mad every game. It didn't matter which team won. I was more upset that the other team lost. I just found myself and by the end. I was like, oh, I don't like any of this. So uh, like, I, I, it's weird. It's, it's like one of the better, you know, rivalry things that I never like watching those games, but when right. either of them, the unifier is that I can always go after Edmonton. You know, like I, I always want, I always want to take down Edmonton, no matter who's playing. Well, that that's a plus for you, at least, anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, the other thing I need to ask is, because you were born and raised in Calgary, where did you go to high school? I went to Rundle College. I was, uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Up the, the campus used to be up in the northeast. Um, so it was actually, it was out by the airport. Uh, right. Um, yeah, so I, 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 yeah, and then they moved, the, the school moved, I think, the year after I graduated, but I, I never, I was never at the new one. Okay, well, that's fair. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's get into actually part of the reason we're actually here. Um, let's let's chat a little bit about you as an artist, and uh, when it all kind of began. What started for you first? Was it music, acting? I think music was there. <clears throat> I mean, you know, a lot of people will be in like school plays and that kind of thing, but I, I didn't really look at acting as like a thing that I wanted to do career wise until I was a little ways into university. Where whereas acting, or rather, music was something that like from a very early age this you know like my, my dad always had guitars around the house and he played in bands like his whole life and so there was mu always music stuff around my house I, I started playing guitar when i was 11 and by the time i was 13 i'd started a band that i played in for like eight years and that was like that was everything i wanted to do like, I, I remember specifically sitting um in my living room my friend newman who, who i played in all these bands with um, he said like, oh, I, we were all talking about like what we wanted to do for the rest of our lives. And he was like, oh, I, I want to be like a professional musician. I want to do this for the rest of my life. And I think that was the first time it ever dawned on me that you could do that. You know, I hadn't really like 
I, you know, thought about that too heavily before. And, but from literally from that conversation on, I was like, oh, that's absolutely what I want to do. And, you know, I, I've gone on to play in a million bands and projects and put out a bunch of different music since then. But that, that's always been a big part of my life. And then acting was something I got into a little later. Okay. And has it always been country music? No, no. I mean, it's been a lot of different things. That band that I started off, you know, we, we were mainly playing cover songs and that it would have been a lot of like punk rock and like a lot of funk as well. Like we, we, we liked bands like Nirvana and we liked the red hot chili peppers. So sort of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it, like at that age, you're just imitating the stuff that you really, really like. Um, but I did that for years only when that band ended, um, did I sort of start my like solo project. Um, and that was when I, I started making country music. And honestly, it was, it was weird because that, that was I wasn't living in Calgary at that point. Um, I say that because like Calgary is kind of synonymous with country music a lot of the time, which wasn't my thing in high school. Like that wasn't what like I gravitated towards at all. But then w when I moved to Vancouver and like I felt like I was all of a sudden out of it, uh, I kind of creeped back in. You know, there was there was a guy that I went to university with who was always playing like Willie Nelson songs on our on our floor, and I just remember like going and listening to that with him. And a big turning point I remember I had is I went to the uh, the Calgary Stampede, and on the Coke stage I saw Dirk Bentley play back in like 2008 or something like that, and it was like he put on a show that took a ton of the stuff that I love from rock music as well as like the stuff that I liked about country music and he had it in one place. And that was, I think the first time I really saw it all like kind of come together like that. And that was like, that was the, the big catalyst for me. I was just like, cause you know, with, within, I, I love all kinds of music and within any genre, I think there's stuff that I love and stuff that I don't like, you know, that would be true of rock, of pop, of country. There's things that I dig and like stuff less. So, um, I think that was just all of a sudden me seeing a lane in country music where I'm like, Oh, cool. I can go there. Well, even when it does come to country music, I think it's developed so much over, you know, within the last 15 years, really, or yeah. even a little bit before that, where it's not all twang, right? Which is, I think, what a lot of people relate to when they think country music. Mm -hmm. it, it's got that, you know, other elements, whether it be a little bit of even a hip hop or, or dance. Yeah, or, I mean, you, right? you so can... It's all, yeah. I was, you, you can find all kinds of that in that you, you can find elements of, of hip hop in it. You can find elements of rock in it. You can find elements of pop in it. Um, and some of that I like and some of that I don't. And, I, and, and on a case by case basis, you know, like I, I don't like to just definitively say like, oh, I don't like that kind of country. It's like there's certain artists that come along every year that I all of a sudden hear a track and go, oh, that's that's interesting. Like, I don't tend to select music by genre. I tend to go more by, I actually kind of love that a lot of playlists now are more mood based of being like, cool, do you want like uplifting music or do you want like, you know, d like sad music or, or something? And because you could fill that up with stuff from different genres. And to me, that's more, um, that's how, more how I think about it as like, as an artist. Because I, I know you can through production tricks in the final phase of something that, cool, we're going to add some banjo and dobro to this and you're going to make it feel like a country song. Or you could say, we're going to add some like heavy distorted guitars and it's going to feel like a rock song or we're going to add trap hats to it. And it's going to feel like, like a hip hop song. It, it, there are certain like little things you can do at the end of production of a song and, and drift it in a bunch of different, you know, places. Um, to me, it's more about like, I, I kind of go in for what the song is in the first place. And, and you know, th then I guess at the end, you have to make some decisions on those things. Right. And you, you, you were, of course, saying that your dad was also a musician in, mm -hmm. in bands and so What was like? Did you take any influences from what your dad was doing as well, and kind of in, integrate that into some of your stuff? Or I mean, a lot of it would have been through what both he and my mom like listened to a lot when I was growing up. Like, I specifically remember the first songs that I ever like listened to, and like the first cassette tapes that I had were. I had the Beatles, I had the Beach Boys, and I had Hank Williams Sr. And I remember specifically having those three tapes and just like constantly listening to them. And then I think I also had like the Batman Forever soundtrack, which is like a totally other ballgame. Uh, but but that stuff ends up really mattering because if you when you're a kid, you you're such a sponge, you know, and there's still things from those those specific cassette tapes where I'm like, oh, I know I still like when you're picking apart your songwriting, you kind of have a certain DNA, a certain footprint at some point. It's like when you listen to a Beatles song, you can tell if McCartney or Lennon wrote a line almost always because they have a certain like drift to them. Um, 
there are certain things like that in my own writing that I'm like, oh, I can hear probably where that came from, like what band that came from. So, so some of the biggest influence probably was just my parents had like, you know, whatever collection of tapes and, and vinyl and, and, and that kind of stuff that they would have listened to at the time that, you know, would have been a big part of what I was listening to. And then, and then, yeah, I mean, my, my dad played in this like super cool, he was in a band in the late sixties called the sugar and spice. And to me, they're like the quintessential, like cool sixties, late sixties rock band. There was like this, I think it's like a seven piece band with like three girl singers and the, and the rest of the guys. And they, you know, they had like a bus that had flowers on the side of it. And like, it, it, it just, it looks like what the, the dream version of that kind of looks like, you know, just that, that era, the way it's been kind of romanticized after the fact it looked like whenever I see pictures of it, I'm like, Oh my God, you got to be there for that. So I find right. that tremendously cool. And, and when did you kind of write your first song, I guess? I wrote my first song when I was 11 years old and it was called Rush. And it was three chords and there was no lyrics to it at the time. And then my my friend Newman, uh, the bass player, he added some lyrics to it later when we started a band when we were 13. I remember that specifically. It was just like, I feel like most people remember the first song they ever wrote. Yeah. Like it, you know, it was literally, I remember I couldn't play bar chords yet. So I was just, it was just one finger lying across the neck playing a very improper, like, I don't know, it'd be, I guess, a like a fourth or something. It was not a nice chord and just in three spots. Um, but I was very, I was pretty stoked about it. You know, it was a song. It was, it was mine, you know? And, and from there you just, you just <laughs> I feel like it's important to dive in and do that. I always tell most people when they're trying to get into anything, but songwriting is a good example. You just like, you have to suck at it for a, for a good while. There's like no way to be good at something without sucking at it for a while. And that can be, sometimes if you let it can be a really enjoyable phase like me and me and my buddy new often talk about playing in that band that we grew up playing in and how it's some of our favorite music memories and we've gone on to have like like he came on the shania tour with me and he's had like a number one rock song on his own and like you know they, we've done some stuff afterwards that are like these bigger career things but there was something untainted about like this early band and that there were no stakes there was no commercial success we weren't that great we were playing in garages and house parties and the occasional bar that would let us play there underage um and you were learning it all on the go um and so I, I think there's something if you let that phase be fun you know uh it's it's a ton of fun when, there, when there's zero stakes on it you know and you're just you're doing it because you love it yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of, of Shania, when did, how did that meeting come about to begin with? And uh, was that before or, or after your first album? So that was just before my first album came out. So my first album, I mean, it's, it's funny because I'll say like my first album when, as always, like it, it's the way it kind of goes when you put out your first major label album, that becomes your debut. And it's funny because I was in 2015, but like I'd been playing in bands for like, you know, a decade with like tons of material coming out before that. But that was like, you know, I guess the official big start point. So it, it, that was also the year of the Shania tour. Um, and honestly, y your guess is as good as mine as to how that properly materialized. I li I got a phone call. I, I assume there was some background politicking that went into that. But like it was it, the strangest thing. And the reason I highlight this is usually in the music industry, someone will always want to take credit for something good happening. Like if something like that happens, you'll always have someone be like, well, I orchestrated that. No one ever told me that. I, I just got a phone call from my manager who said that they got a phone call saying that Shania wanted me to open uh, all the Canadian dates and a couple of the US dates on her farewell tour. And oh, wow. would I be available in June of 2015? And I was like, yes. Um, and I, I, I asked specifically a number of people in my team about it. Like, do you know how this was orchestrated? And I, I either got no, I have no idea, or I got one very coy answer from the then Universal Music President just saying, it's, like, it's all about having a good team, Wes. And I was like, what does that mean, man? <laughs> like, did you do this? Um, I, I mean, maybe he did. But um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I was just, <laughs> I was grateful to be there. And then she brought us back for the second leg of the tour, which meant a lot to me because I always felt it was kind of validating that we didn't screw things up too badly on the first leg. That it was like, oh, cool. This is months later. You have you you're choosing a new opening act, and you have selected me again. I'm like, thank you. Right. Well, I, and I was going to ask, like, your your first time opening for her. Like, I'm just imagining what those kind of emotions you probably had at that time. And, yeah, uh, it was. Um, 
it was a mixture of like, you know, it was like this euphoria and feeling really, you know, like this special thing. Like I, I was acutely aware, like, oh, this is probably going to be one of the cooler things I get to do in my life, regardless of what I do after. Like this will always feel really special. I, you know, it's the all of a sudden playing arena shows is, is wild. But there and there and then there was like an element of fear to it, um, where it's just like. I mean, I played a lot of shows. Like, it wasn't like I was green in, in any sense coming into it, but it's, you, do you feel ready for it? Um, I think the main, I remember two weeks out, we got an email asking if I would do um, Party for Two with her, like one of one of her big hits. She It's a duet, uh, and and she wanted me to sing it every night on the tour. And it was two, like, two weeks out, and we were in the middle of rehearsals, and I was like, obviously the answer is yes, but I just remember being like, oh, God, now I've got to, like, I get, okay, I just can't mess this up. Um, and I we rehearsed it once in, on the day of I showed up in Seattle and I remember we like got there and I was standing side stage about to go up for the rehearsal and all these like pyrotechnics were going off and I remember grabbing one of her like stage hands and just being like hey d is there like a schematic like that I can see for like where I shouldn't stand for like the fire vents because like you can get burned very badly and I remember he's just like you just want to stay real close to Shania and I was just like, oh, my God. So, so I went up there in the rehearsal and I was probably just like staying like right beside her. And then I went and then I realized um, there were no pyrotechnics in our particular number. Oh. So the, guy, the guy was messing with me for sure, um, <laughs> which, you know, good on That's him. Awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah it, 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 honestly, though, after I think it took about two or three shows into the tour and then it switched from being scary to just being like the most fun I've ever had because you, you feel so supported. You know, she's great. The song is great. Her band is great. The road crew is great. The crowd is a sold out arena. It sort of is like in, in all those ways, you're as supported as you can be to just go up there and like be an artist and have fun, which is what we did. Right. Yeah. Well, and we kind of we kind of jumped into the whole Shania thing, which probably makes it kind of sound like you, you had this instant success, but that's not the case. Right. I played a lot of bars with zero people in them. I've actually certifiably played to zero people. I, we, there was one show that we were on a, on a tour. I was playing bass in my friend's band and we played, it was crazy. We, we played in Calgary the night before at like the Palomino and it was sold out. Like the It was like ram packed. And then the next night we played in Edmonton and there was actually no one there. There was like, actually like, like the bar staff at one point left, like they went on a smoke break and we realized there was actually no one in the bar. There wasn't even a sound guy for that gig. We'd done our own sound. And so we looked at each other. And we're like, we're just having a band practice in a bar. Right, <laughs> and yeah. so like, it, you know, but no, no lies. It, because it wasn't like that entire tour run was, was that bad. That was like sort of the, the only show that, that happened. We, we honestly had, had a big laugh about it. And then eventually one of our friends showed up. And so they were the only person there. And so we all got down on the floor and like played like a full on rock show to one person. <laughs> Uh, and then I think we went and drank a lot after the show and just tried to forget that it happened. So, I mean, you know, I, I've, everything between that and the Shania tour, I, I have done, you know, like I've, I've played many different configurations to different numbers of people. And, and how long were you actually touring with her? It was just for the, we did, we did like, no, no, sorry. It, it was like, it was like six weeks. It was like a month six and then it was like a chunk of another month. So it was like for all of June in 2015, I think we did 18 or 19 dates in the end. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, uh, well, let's talk a little, uh, let's jump right into your, your first album, actually. And uh, maybe you can kind of tell us how Edge of the Storm, I think it was called, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, maybe you can just kind of talk us into how that came into development. And you know. Yeah. I mean, that, that was sort of a, it's always the thing that people will say, like, you know, your first album takes a lifetime to make. And that kind of felt like it, where it was just, I got to cast my mind back a little bit now, but I think kind of the core of that was that I had been playing music in like, you know, in, in bands and playing bars and, and doing all kinds of stuff. And I find when you're a new artist starting out and you look at a really successful artist, you go, okay, they have, they have great songs, great production. They've got merch. They're on tour. They have music videos. They have great social media that there's like a lot of different things they're doing. Um, and I, and it's a real temptation. I think you can chase after all those things at once. And the problem ends up being, if you don't actually have the core, which to me is like strong songs, 
uh, none of the rest of it works. Like everything collapses. And, and, I, and I felt like I'd been doing that for, for a good chunk of time. And the one thing I remember in the run up to that album was being like, cool, I'm going to put aside a full year and like, no, there will be no more videos. There will be no more like trying to play. Like it, we're just going to do songwriting. And I'd never taken songwriting as seriously as that. And that was when I started co-writing. That would have been like 2012. Um, and so I just, I, I started writing with a ton of different people and just focusing on songs. And I, met, and I met a guy named Jeff Johnson. Um, and we ended up, the first song we ever wrote together is a song called Duet. And that was the, an interesting turning point in my like career and life. And like, we wrote this song, we recorded a demo of it. And all of a sudden, a lot of doors just felt like they were opening. Uh, so, some of it's luck. Like, there's no way you can, I, I don't believe any of this is just like sheer talent based. Like, there's a lot of things of right place at right time. And I think a lot of that was working in my favor at the time. Um, but I will say the song <laughs> to a lot of the like industry people, they can sense the money around something where it was like, we would play it and you could feel people not getting in your way. It felt like a lot of gatekeepers that formerly might have stood in my way or not been interested were like, oh, cool, I want to facilitate this. Um, and I, I released that song in 2013 uh, with no agent. I had no manager. I had no label. And it ended up going to number nine on the country billboard charts, which was, again, uh, uh, there was a fair bit of, again, a decent amount of luck involved in my, in my opinion. But I think the song also really clicked. Um, and so from there, I ended up signing a record deal and spending the next year like down in Nashville writing a lot and just sort of doing what I'd done the year before of like gathering. I sort of had half the album already done from when I was in like a full indie artist. I put out a couple of singles um, and then I basically spent a year with a label kind of building the other half of the record and all of that then came together um, for what we ended up putting out in like late 2015 as Edge of the Storm. So that, and that was like by the time I was putting that out, I'd had four think three or four top 20 singles and and done the Shania tour and it was sort of like riding on all that and we put out the the first record and that was the like yeah it felt like it kind of was the first chapter of all of that was was done nice nice no that's awesome nice. um we do have a question that popped up so I'm just gonna oh, share cool. that real quick here um as an actor and singer have you ever wanted to be in a musical if yes which one would you like to be in oh my gosh uh yeah totally um and you know back in when I was in Good question. Um, also, hi, Skylar. Um, yeah, back when I was in university, I did I did a musical at that point in time. I did a show called Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, um, which is, you know, it was wild and wacky. And I think when I was younger, I did a couple of musicals in, in, in school. And I, I always really enjoyed that stuff. And like, I, I, I remember, um, yeah. I'm just trying to think if there was one that I would love to be in more than any other. Cause I, I would totally be interested in that. It definitely is like, it's a skill set in and of itself that like, you don't want to be the, the, the weak link in that. Cause some of those people are, are, you know, everybody in those is a triple threat of like, you know, they can sing, they can act, they can dance. Um, I'm trying to think if there's one musical above any other, there's a show called Dear Evan Hansen. That's, that's pretty rad. Um, that would be really fun to be a part of. I mean, honestly, I, uh, I don't have a good answer on like what show it would probably be, but I would absolutely be interested in doing that. You know, I, I think I miss a lot of the times, you know, I, I'd done a couple of plays through university and a little bit after it. And I've ended up not doing a ton of that in the last like many years since, um, because there's such a huge commitment you have to put in in the rehearsal process and during the run of a show. And the trick for me often becomes that if I'm auditioning for other things for film or doing anything music wise, if any of those things come up, I then am in a tough position where it's like, oh, do I take this opportunity uh, at the and, and have to drop out of the show and kind of <clears throat> mess with the people that I'm working with. And the reason I highlight that is that happened <clears throat> back in like 2009 to me. I was on I was doing a, a friend's play and I was the lead in it and we were all the way through rehearsal and all of a sudden I booked um smallville which was like my one of my first like big you know film and tv gigs and i was supposed to be on it for a month and a half and we were two weeks out from the show and i remember having to go to him and be like here's the scenario like i can't do both and fortunately um the first like the one of the stage managers um, my friend chris was who looks a lot like me <laughs> and knew the whole show uh, uh, so he was able to pretty seamlessly step in. And in my opinion, having seen the play, did a better job than I would have done. Um, 
And so I didn't feel like tremendously bad, but I still felt guilty about it because I, I had to, you know, these are people that are my friends and I, I didn't want to, you know, take all this rehearsal time and throw it out the window. Um, and so I've kind of hesitated to go back and do theater unless I, I was going to say like, okay, cool, I'm really going to set aside, you know, six months of time or whatever it is where I won't be doing anything else. Because as the intro of this show suggests, I have my hands in a lot of different things right now. So that's my roundabout answer on that. I do love musicals. Oh, that's fair. And it kind of ties into the, the next point, I guess. So you, you do acting, but you also do directing. Yeah. And um, was it the music <clears throat> videos that kind of triggered the whole directing thing? Totally. The, the, yeah. I mean, I certainly have always had an interest in film just as like, I don't know, somewhere in university, I really, you know, took an interest in it. And I guess there technically is a small chapter of this before music videos of, I wanted to get into it and was interested in directing. Um, and I, I hadn't, I didn't have any like formal film education. And I remember I was going to UBC, they have something there called the UBC Film Society. And it's kind of for people just like that who are interested in it, but aren't like in the film program. And they would take script submissions every year. You could submit uh, short films and they'd take a bunch of scripts from a bunch of people and they'd pick two of them and they'd make them. And so out of all the submissions one year, they chose mine. Um, and so I got to direct that and it was this huge learning curve of, um, you know, sh coming up with the storyboard and shot listing thing. And, and, and I ended up, you know, editing it and in the end scoring like a music, like an orchestral piece for it after the fact I became way over involved. I I'd also just recently seen apocalypse now. So it's edited in a ridiculous way with a lot of like fades and long, long cuts. And like, just, I, I took a mi movie that should have been 20 minutes and made it 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> which is funny for me to look at now, but I mean, one of the things I did, so I, I did that and then I just, because I wanted to get better, it was a very DIY approach. I remember I, I found out the UBC, they, they're like the fourth year, the final year of film. I went and bought, or yeah, I think I bought, yeah, their, their, their textbook, like for fourth year film. And I just read it cover to cover. And I, and I got like a fairly inexpensive, uh, camera and just started filming stuff. And then right, like within half a year of that. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, knew, uh, was, was looking to have a music video for, for his like first solo project. And I was like, well, I can direct that. Like, you know, he, he asked me if I could do it. He'd, he'd seen some of the like sort of amateur art filmy stuff I was doing. And he's like, oh, I think you, you can do this. I'm like, okay, cool. So I, I think we had a, a budget of $800 and we spent like months on this thing like shooting all these like crazy sequences. i remember we filmed in the in the garage basement of my building this like knife fight sequence in the middle of the night and like with actual knives like it was very it was it was i i think we like taped them up and stuff but there's things about it now that i'm like good lord dude what were you doing um <laughs> but but it, uh, with a lot of this so much of my life has just been like exploring it and trying it and so i remember you know we finished that music video and and i remember i thought like oh this looks pretty cool and and I wanted a music video for my stuff. It, it became really a, a product of necessity. And like, I didn't have the the funds to go and hire like a big crew or a director who knows what they're doing to direct this. So I was like, okay, I'm going to figure it out. Um, and with enough time and YouTube tutorials, you can, you can figure a lot out. And, and, I, and I had the benefit of, by that point, I was acting um, on a couple of shows. And I remember like on, on Smallville, for example, I, I said to the cinematographer when I was there, I was like, hey, uh, I'm I'm really interested in this. I don't want to bother you. I won't ask you any questions, but do you mind if rather than me going and sitting in my trailer when I'm not working, can I kind of shadow you? I just want to see what you're doing. Um, and he was super cool about it. And as everyone has always been, anytime I've asked that to just be like, yeah, sure. Like, and feel free to ask questions. And so I feel like I kind of picked off a free film education in the first few years of me being on those bigger sets that I was then able to go and take back to these amateur music videos and be like, cool. Like, I remember how they lit this, or I remember what they did to like, like, you know, I was doing it on a, you know, I didn't have their many thousand dollar dolly and camera. I had like a work dolly from Home Depot that we were pushing along a rug to smooth it out. But you, you can do so many things with, with little money if you just have good ideas, if you have interesting ideas of things to shoot. So I kind of got deeper and deeper into that. And eventually like at some point I was real, I realized I was a music video director. Like I was doing these and I was doing them for other artists and, and, I kind of got deep into it when we'd hired a director to do my first, like the, the video for duet and it went very sideways. Uh, and we ended up having to fire that director midway through the shoot. There were some serious like safety issues going on um, and budgetary things. 
Um, so I, and it was honestly, it was one of the, it was probably the most stressful month of my life. And I ended up, I, t- I took over and I, a bunch of the crew agreed to come back for this like half day of shooting with me. And we shot, we shot the, the video for this. And it seemed like it was this disaster where it was like, I, I almost had to go and tell CMT who was funding the video, like, Hey, sorry guys, like all the money's gone and we don't have a music video for you guys. Uh, but weirdly we, we got, we got through it and I, directed it and edited it and color corrected it and closed caption it because there was no money left to, to, to hire any of this out. And I remember turning it over to CMT and the song went up the charts. And I remember sitting next year at the Country Music Awards and it was up for video of the year and I was up for director of the year for it. And I remember just being like, oh God, if they only knew what a disaster this song <laughs> was. But that was, that was the point where I kind of shifted gears because all of a sudden that was me directing with like a big crew. Um, it was trial by fire where it was just like, okay, this is everything I know and we're going to see if we can make it work. And shortly thereafter, I, I remember I did a video for, for a band called one more girl or some good friends of mine. Um, and we had like big pyrotechnics going off and all these like crazy camera moves. And like, there, there was a bunch of stuff going on. And I remember just being like, okay, I guess I'm a video director at this point. Like, you know, C- CMT has me directing some videos for them. Um, so I feel like I was really lucky this is one of those weird areas where sometimes having the bunch of different careers, they fight with each other, but that was one where it was like, felt like it was pinging off of like my music career and my acting career and just my general interest in film created an opportunity where if I just kept applying time and energy, I was able to do something that felt um, like a lot of fun for me. And so for the the song, uh, listen to me, Mm. Um, was that was that a video you also directed? Yeah, that's probably my favorite video that I've directed in a while. It's like one of them, yeah. Okay, because um, I do actually have that on cue here to, oh, to cool. kind of play. I, I thought it was cool, especially because I, I was making the assumption that you did direct it. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I so what I liked about all of it is it's you know it kind of tells the story of you know your your development as a musician yeah it shows some of your acting skills it shows your directing skills it's all encompassing i find this the song and video combined i feel like i um, kind of end up still using it as my calling card of like hey if you just want to know everything about me in about three and a half minutes like here's the closest you're gonna get um and it was more of an editing piece almost than a some of it's directorial because we shot a bunch of stuff as you, you know it's, it's a lot of footage from like my childhood and that so it, it became this archival thing where it was just going through tons of hours of like old family footage and being like oh cool this is how that'll work and and it, it, it's interesting because it's this balance of footage that means a lot to me versus stuff that tells a story and is accessible to someone watching it because sometimes you watch something and you go oh cool that was that trip we took but like the footage is so grainy and messed up that you can't really see what's going on so is this it was a bit of a balancing act there but i was i it was really it was really cool i i think i called my parents and a few of my old friends like a million times during it because I would watch a piece with them in it and be like, "Do you remember when this happened?" Um, right. Yeah. So it, it was a uh, yeah. It's it's my favorite. <laughs> so I mean, if you're you're okay with it, I'll yeah, I'll, totally. I'll throw it up there, and uh, folks watching can have a look at it and see everything, Wes. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. Um, <laughs> I love I love the ending, by the way. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, I remember trying to figure out a way to sneak that in there somewhere. <laughs> but honestly, well, as I was watching, like the first time I was watching it, I uh, I kept looking at the timestamps, and I'm like, oh my god, it feels so. Old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when I was thinking. Uh, anytime you, I remember at the time being like, do I include the timestamps? I was like, yeah, it's just the, <laughs> however old the ending one was when it happened is what, what it was. Right, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So when you were doing a lot of it, like uh, I'm, I'm guessing you did most of the editing yourself, then uh, did all of it. Right? Yeah, all of it. Um, yeah, it, it it was like, again, it was like easily my favorite, you know, project of that, and it was really an editing project. Like it started off as, I think it was going to just be a lyric video, and then I just kind of kept adding to it and doing little pieces to it. it. It was like the first time I think I directed something as well that was really simple like comparative to some of the videos I'd done before that were these like really wacky big plot lines. I was like, I think this one's, you know, obviously it's got like a cheat code built into it. Of It's got all this like home footage that you can't, you know, there's no way to go and shoot that in a way that's more impactful. Um, but yeah, so I was just trying to like take a whole lifetime and present like 
a, you know, a little telling of my life and music and a little bit else. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, were you up for any CCMA awards for that one? Or? I think so. I think that went up for, I think I was up for director of the year for that, if I'm remembering okay. right. And do you remember uh, your first nomination in general? Yeah. Yeah. You know, weirdly, I guess I, I think I won my first, like I've, I've, I've got one C I was, I was, I was doing it right the other night and I was like, Oh, can't you see? Like I've got all my nominations up on this wall here. I just keep them all. <laughs> they're all right there. All 13 of them, but there is one award, uh, which actually is up right there. But, um, and it, I got the, it was like the discovery award of like, and it's, it's like not a norm, a conventional CCMA award. It was like the first year they did it and they did this for a number of years. It was this program of they put six of us in it. And it was sort of like a competition where, you know, it was a, to discover the next like new big thing. Um, and so it was like, it, it was interesting. It was a bunch of rounds of like, uh, uh, of stuff we had to send them and songs and then interviews. And, and then we played a bunch of performances and judges critiqued us and stuff like that. But it, it honestly, it was this like kind of country boot camp thing that ended up actually being a lot of fun. And, and I, 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 I did win it. So that, and that was like right at the same time as duet was reaching its like chart apex um, back in 2013. So that was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So that, that was, I guess the first, you know, nomination. And then there, and then the year after that, I had like, you know, more formal, you know, normal nominations, which, which I didn't win any of for, for, for all the years. Uh, but I do again, I have them all. On the nice, nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's nice to be recognized. You know, uh, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't put a ton of stock in awards because I know how it works and I don't mean that to be overly jaded. Like, you know, when you're, when I was with like a big record label kind of thing, you have a huge advantage because the, you know, the, and, and that's like the same for the acting world and music world. And, and most people like who are in it get that. Uh, I don't think anybody gets nominated for award or wins an award and doesn't feel some degree of, you know, it, it feels nice to, to have someone be like, Hey man, you did a good job on that. Like, congratulations. But most people I know myself included, like that's not really, what I'm in it for, like, it, I, I like, I like making art at the end of the day. I like making music and making movies and that kind of stuff. And if those things happen along the way, the main positive piece for me is kind of wrapped up in like, I don't aspire to be a famous person, but the, the value of fame is it's a commodity. It's like money. It allows you to do things. So if winning an award means I have a little bit more control over a tour, I might go on or, if being a little more famous allows me to have a role in a project that I'm really passionate about, then those things matter to me. But in and of themselves, I don't think there, there's not a lot of value to them for me. Um, but there, again, it's, it's a commodity that if you can do something with it, um, then it can be helpful. That's fair. Yeah. Um, my, my two cents. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're <laughs> amazing how time flies. We're actually uh, like just over 40 minutes into the show here. Oh, cool. And <laughs> We haven't even really talked about, uh, you know, the, the big topic. Um, but before we even get there, I still want to mention one other project that you were a part of, uh, Honey Girls. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, yeah, if you don't mind, maybe you can you can chat a little bit about that and, and your role within that and uh, how that came, kind of came about. Yeah, I got to play a guy who would have, like, a lot of plaques on the walls. I got to play <laughs> the, the greatest writer-producer in the world, Calvin Maxine. Um yeah, no, that was, that was just like a super fun piece where it was this like, I kind of thought of that whole thing of like, oh, what, what the message of this movie is like, what would I want to tell my teenage self or even child self pursuing music kind of thing? Because it's very like uplifting in that sense and like telling you to follow your dreams and be yourself. And, and I, I say that not in an ironic way because it, it just like, it, it's kind of like earnest in those things. Uh, so to me, I, I got to play like, a music mentor in that, which is, I, I kind of chuckle at because like, I don't think at any point in time you ever feel like you really know what you're doing. Like most of the people that I know and really aspire or no, really look up to still will be like, Oh, I'm just, you know, doing the best I can. Like no, no one ever like comes up and gives you a piece of paper. That's like, you understand the music industry now. Um, so it was cool to pretend for, <laughs> for a day there to walk in and, 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 you know, work with the Shanti and, and actually it was, it was neat. We got to film one of the days, in a studio where I actually recorded a bunch of the stuff that was on edge of the storm. So it was a neat little throwback to my own life. It was, yeah, it was a fun project. And where, like, where is this 
I think because it was released in October, I think, right? Yeah. And where where can folks kind of check it out? I don't think it's streaming. I think you have to either buy it on the like the iTunes store or it's like on on DVD. I mean, I I think it, like Build a Bear is is behind it. Uh, it like which again, I I didn't know they made movies prior to that, no. but I believe they're probably selling it in their stores. Um, so but but yeah, you can you can definitely find it on like the iTunes store. It seemed like the most the, the, the easiest one. Well, it's because, you know, when my kids were younger, we used to get them build bears all the time. So uh, it's good to know that all that money is going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I once, uh, uh, um, one of my, like, a, a fan, um, her name's Jillian, uh, uh, who's been wonderful to me over the years. She she showed up at a show in Edmonton, her and her sister, and they had made a build a bear of me. And they they nice. gave it to me during the show, like, on stage. And it was like, it was a red haired build a bear that was hold like, they'd modeled it after one of my like uh, uh, album covers. And so it looked exactly like it, me and that, it, it kind of blew my mind because it was just, it was all of a sudden holding a bear version of myself. Right. No, that's awesome actually. Yeah. yeah. That was neat. <laughs> um, well, and actually going back to the music itself, where, where can the folks actually listen? I, I know some of it's on Spotify cause I was yeah. some of it out there. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I think basically everything that I've released commercially is, is on Apple music, Spotify, Amazon, like sort of all the all the streamers, you'd be able to find all my songs. Okay, awesome. Now, your new project, um, which, by the way, I will say that I, I actually had a few auditions for this show, and just oh wow, lucky enough to get in there. Yeah. But uh, I am glad that a, a Calgary local did. So yeah, man, I was stoked about that. Uh, I I was like the most jet, like you know, people were like. Like, oh, it's shitty in Calgary. It's gonna be really cold in the winter, and, and and I was just like, I get to go to Calgary. This is awesome. So I like, I got to have pizza from my favorite place, and like, which is Spiro's, by the way, is my favorite oh, restaurant in the city. Little Shout plug for Spiro's. There we go. Yeah, heck yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, I got to walk down and go to like Princess Island Park every day. That was like my go-to, and I was just like, it was like super cold. Um, but I would go down there just like bundled up and sit by the river, uh, just because it, you know, it's a place I love when I when I lived there. Um. But yeah, man, working on Guilty Party was a ton of fun. It, it was probably one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on. And I think a, most of that just comes down to the people. You know, like, it was a really good group of folks. Um, the scripts were great, too. Like, that, that's, that's always a good sign when you get to crack that open. I remember we did the we did the table reads for it as, um, as like, a Zoom table read, which I'd never done before. And it was kind of neat because you get to see everyone at home before you've gotten your, like, costume and your set haircut and you've showed up and it was just sort of like everybody, you know, coming from wherever they're coming from in the world. Um, but I just remember laughing a ton through it. it uh, and actually, like, it's this weird mixture. Like, it, it's a show that I've struggled in interviews and just repeatedly, like, do a bad job of explaining because it's because I think it's complicated in a good way and that it's, like, a mixture of, of, of drama and comedy. It's this, it's a dramedy, it's a dark comedy, and it's this really like heartfelt story at the same time. But I think it was done really well um, with the group of folks they brought together. And like the onset experience for it was was a blast. It was so collaborative and they were so cool with improvisation and just like trying different things and there were no bad ideas. And to me as an actor, that's the most fun environment to be in because then you can try stuff, you know, because I've worked on shows where you, you try something and immediately a script supervisor comes and says, like, that's not the line. Say it the way it's supposed to be on the page. And you'd be like, okay, cool. Like, you, you, and I, I, I'm not going to fight that. Like, you know, whatever the show, whatever the, is the vision of the, the people making it, you kind of got to roll with that. But when you do get, get a bit of a license to be like, cool, we've done it that way. Now let's try it this way. Maybe we'll find something even better. Um, that, to me, is where you make the coolest stuff. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. And so, according to uh, Deadline.com, you're you're playing the role of Pierre, which yeah. is uh, uh, kind of a co-worker of Kate Beckinsale's character. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you can... I'm assuming this was a, uh, a self-tape demo that you uh, submitted yeah. for this? Yeah, Yeah, actually, I remember specifically. I, I, I So I sent it. I was told that I had the role. And then I got an email, like, a couple weeks later being like, all right, you got a callback for that role tonight, like a Zoom callback. And I was like, wait, I thought I had the role. Um, and they're like, oh, I guess they changed their mind. Like the, the network would like to see like a Zoom callback. And I hadn't done that. And I and I remember just like, I find that so nerve wracking, not from an acting perspective, but from a tech perspective of 
trying to connect with someone who there might be a bit of a delay. Um, you know, your eyeline might not be exactly what you want. You're trying to to light it. And I remember I was I was there at like it was supposed to be at 7 a.m. the next morning, and it was like 11 at night. And I was like just working away, trying to like set things up and, and get it all good. And I was stressing, and and my agent called me, and she's like, "Change a the plan. They they they're not. They don't need a, a callback. They you've got the role." And I remember just being like. For the first time ever, like I was just, I was happier that I didn't have to do the callback than I even was about getting the role because I was so stressed about it, especially because it was like heart of COVID time when it's like I've interacted with no people for a year and all of a sudden you're going to throw me in like a, a proper audition again where they're going to be like, hey, tell us about you. Like, do you have any weird things about yourself that'll make us not want to ever see you again? And like, I don't know what I'll say. Um, it's, it's totally true though because I actually had that experience as well where I got a callback for, for Zoom. And uh, yeah, especially again, it was not that long ago, maybe three months ago. Yeah. And again, like you said, I hadn't done an in-person interview since pre-COVID. Yeah. So to be in front of the camera and, you know, of course, you the way technology is, you got one person flashing up, then another. And totally. Like, uh... <laughs> when I've, heard, I've heard horror stories where it's like sometimes people have done auditions and there's no reader visible. It's just a black screen and they're watching you and you're reading to no one, but there's a reader on their end. And I'd asked even for this one, I was like, oh, can I like provide my own reader? And they'd said like, no, it's going to be our reader. So I was just like stressing. I, I, I got off the phone with my agent. And I just like immediately cracked a beer and just like drank the whole thing. I was like, oh, thank God. I don't have to do that. Um, totally. Yeah. I was just, I, I find that stuff. And I'm like a, a fairly tech savvy guy. Like I, I do video. Like that's, that's my thing. But I still don't like it when, especially when you're in an acting situation, you you just don't have the the support where it's like if there's a problem i hate the idea that i'm going to be sitting there trying to fix it while being watched you know it's like oh there's a problem with your microphone or something like that like, oh, sorry yeah please don't judge me please don't uncast me uh, right. yeah, so totally. yeah so that was again like a, a self-tape for that which is which is very nice yeah no it's definitely an interesting experience um yeah i, I don't know about you but uh you know i'm okay with them just doing it straight off demos no, oh totally no. I, I i much prefer that where it's like if, if you want like i'd rather send that and then you can send me some notes or something like if, if you know if you're really considering someone for it um like that's what i would want to do if i was directing it to just be like, cool send me whatever you want i'll send you some notes and and like i don't know i i just think as well you you get like i can shoot it on like a, a proper camera you know and like have the lighting and the sound all be like processed properly. Like when I send in an audition, like a self tape, uh, I process the sound afterwards and I color correct it. Like, and that's me because I'm a psychopath and I'm a director, but I, I'm just like, Oh, it's pretty easy to do. I've just created a couple of like pre existing LUTs that I'll like throw on top of it and be like, great. Now this looks the way I want it to. And I can process the sound. So it's actually compressed and sounds like a movie. Um, these things take, five minutes for me to do but i just think it makes the watching experience feel closer to what you'll actually get i mean i also like for the thing i love about doing self-tapes during covid is props um i love to to use weird props like I, I for the audition for this i had a bunch i remember i was eating like a bowl of raisins or like a thing full of raisins and i just i felt it was like character appropriate it was at a morning meeting and i was like he's the kind of guy and weirdly when i got to set props was like we think Pierre's the kind of guy who's like eating all the time. And I was like, okay, well, we're on the same page. And so I actually used the same, like it was the exact same raisins that I'm, that I'm eating in the actual thing. The reason I like that, this seems like a mundane detail, but I like that when you use the kind of props that'll actually be there on the day, that it feels like a, a real place. Like you, like you right now are wearing a, a head, a, like a headset and I've got this on, I'm sitting on a couch. Like there's something real about the environment here that, that's just part of life. Um, and, and so when you actually go to like shoot the scene, you're going to have, if it's a scene with a cop, you know, you might have a gun, you might have a knife, you might have a backpack or something like that. I like bringing that stuff into the audition because then it's, you're giving them exactly what they're going to get um, on the day of. And that can sometimes feel weird on a in-person audition to be like, Hey, I brought in like two bags of chips and uh, also a cowboy hat. <laughs> It feels it feels easier to just do that at home, and you know, I, I've had no complaints on it so far. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I've had a similar situation where, yeah, the, you know, I'm, that's the thing you, you do when you're as an actor, right? And you're trying to develop these things for your auditions. You have to have that characterization of who they are, right? So yeah. I had the similar situation where I'm supposed to be this janitor eating his lunch. 
Oh, sure. I, was, I sit in there. I was eating my peanut butter sandwich, and yeah, sure, my words were a little bit muffled in a but, way. But, but that's what it should be, right? I, right? I always find it strange if you audition and you're this, and you're just like a just a floating head here, and the scene is you're at a desk working on a computer. I yeah. find that weird because it's like that's not what the thing is anymore. Part of the activity is like you know, if I'm on my phone here talking to you. We're having it's, it's just it reads a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, it's not that I think you want to lean on props as like a crutch, um, and hide behind them, but if it helps with the characterization, it's the same as costumes, where it's like you know, I find a lot of times when you work on a show, Pierre was very much the case, you find a lot of character in the wardrobe fitting. Like when I showed up, you, you actually then get to see a little bit of what the director's thoughts are trickling down through like the person they've hired to do wardrobe, what they've pulled for you. You put those clothes on and all of a sudden it, it's part of that like collaborative thing. So I find when you can get the jump on that in the audition and already have, you know, the look and the body of it, it's, um, it just makes it feel closer. Cause uh, good acting, in my opinion, you don't feel like you're acting, you know, it's just like when you're actually there on set and you're just having a conversation, you know, it's myself and Kate and the other couple of folks in, in pop bite on, on guilty party. It, you know, the lines you have to say, but you're just communicating with these people, you, you know? Uh, so he's trying to get yourself as close to that as you can in the audition to just having it feel like what it's going to be like on the day. Yeah, absolutely. And so, of course, I'm sure the question that most people are going to be asking is, uh, what was it like to work with Kate? It uh, was, oh, sorry, I'll let you finish. Oh, well, I was gonna, all I was going to say is I, I have heard she's a bit of a practical joker. I don't know if you experienced any of that or yeah, uh, I, I can I can see that. I mean that was just inter so so first of all it was wonderful. Honestly, that that was like the, the, the one of the best parts of it is like, you know, whoever the like number one on the call sheet is on any show really dictates the tone of how things are gonna go. And she was lovely and tremendously like willing to be self-deprecating and funny. Uh, of just like her character, like in a lot of the scenes that we do is lampooned pretty hard by like the rest of us. Like my, my character spends most of his time being an antagonist and, be, and being a dick to her uh, uh, along with a couple of the other people working there. And she was very on board to like give us ammunition for that. Like there, there's a there's a sequence in, in one of the episodes where like I brought in a, a Tupperware thing full of Fruit Loops. This was in a later episode. I was like, yep, yeah, Pierre's eating stuff. And so I was sitting there and she's making this impassioned speech, you know, about whatever she was talking about. I, I say that partially in character, whatever she's talking about. And I, I'm having none of it. And she, between takes at some point, she's like, well, what if you threw those at me? What if you just started throwing Fruit Loops at me? And I was like, are you giving me permission to try and like beam you? And she's like, oh yeah. And I was like, all right. So, so right when she'd get to like whatever part felt the most like, passion i would just i was throwing handfuls of these things on one take i got one like in her ear um and it what i loved is that like she had no ego about like she didn't feel like oh i kate beckinsale being attacked by wesley it was like it was very good character stuff and it made it it made the scene funnier and it made her character have something to push against um right. which in my opinion is like what the whole function of my character is is i would be like in the video game, I would be the level one boss kind of thing. Not not even the level one boss. I'd be like the level one second henchman or something like that. <laughs> um, so it's just to give her like, because her whole life has been taken from being this like amazing journalist just to 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 bottom of the barrel again, trying to like put it back together. And and she has all these forces pressing against her of like her crappy job. That's us. Her her marriage that has some issues. Uh, uh, the people from her journalistic life that like kind of threw her under the bus and you get to like her whole arc is you, you get to watch her um, try and push back through all of that. So what I loved about working with her is that she got that as an artist and was totally cool to be like, yeah, let's give you guys dumb things to do to me. Like, let's go, let's go for that. Um, nice. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, she was, she was wonderful. That, that definitely makes it more, more fun to be on set. Right. Uh, totally. Totally. Yeah, because that's uh, not always the case. That's not always how things. I, I can think of many times when I would not have someone suggest to me, like, "Do you want to throw Fruit Loops at my head?" <laughs> I can think of many times where that would have probably gotten me fired. Right. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? <laughs> We've been here for an hour. As oh, crazy as that may sound, time flies. Um, so it does fly, and, and uh, but before we, I, I do let you go. Um, Aside from the Fruit Loop scenario, did you have a favorite moment on set? And it doesn't have to be with Kate, just on set. 
Man, I mean, just any other time we got to be in there. Um, actually, there was, there was one thing that was kind of funny. This is just one of those like happy accidents of, again, brought a prop. I had a ball and I was I was throwing it up in the air and catching it. And I had some line where I say something like, like, isn't that the dick cutter? It's some like really like it's it's in right in the script. And it's this like kind of ridiculous line. And it ended up being I threw the ball and it bounced off a wall and came back and hit me in the face as i as i said the line and like people just cracked up like so like the number of lighting guys were like did you like try and do that did you plan it because it was like a pretty tight shot on me so if it had hit me anywhere else you wouldn't have seen it but it like went off two walls and hit me in the face and i yeah that that to me is like one of those things where it's just like cool just keep trying different stuff in takes and sometimes the acting gods shall conspire in your favor <laughs> and so i like that because it was a bit of luck and, and do they keep that take? Um, I haven't watched that episode yet. Uh, so I, I, I just figured out how to watch this in Canada because for a period of time there was, I think Paramount Plus, you couldn't see it in Canada, but I've discovered if you have Apple TV Plus, you can get Paramount Plus through it and it's there. So okay. I, it took it took me a while to, to, to source that out. Uh, so I have, I have some guilty party catch up to, to do myself. And... Thanks for kind of answering that because that's going to be my next question is how are people watching this? I think, <laughs> so. I think in Canada, that's your, I think in the States you can just watch it on Paramount plus. Um, but here I believe I could be wrong about this unless they've resolved it, but it wasn't on the just like pure Paramount plus, but there is like a branch within Apple TV plus where you can get it on Paramount plus. So uh, uh, for anyone who's already got Apple TV, that, then I think it's pretty easy to grab. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, as you guys can see what's scrolling down below, if you want to check out anything else West related, uh, his Twitter's on there, IG website, go check him out, uh, check out his music on Spotify and uh, keep an eye open if you can uh, for, for Guilty Party because that, that looks like a fun one and I'm hoping to come back for a second season. Yeah, yeah, well, hopefully we'll have you on it, man. That would, uh, we, that would we, could, we could reconvene this thing. <laughs> I, I'm hoping there's a second season in, in existence. You know? Right, absolutely. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So thanks for joining us, Wes, and uh, uh, we'll we'll be back next week, I think. So awesome. everybody have a great night. Thanks for having me on.